which he didn't know whether or not they were due to climate change, I think probably they've subsequently shown that they are due to climate change, he had a relatively small reduction in rainfall. The big problem was the reduction in, rain, in runoff was even greater. So instead of a 10% reduction in rainfall, actually translated into a 30 or 40% reduction in runoff into his dams. So some 10 years ago, he started planning for, for this. He did that planning in many ways despite his uh, political masters. Uh, very bold move. He managed to convince them as he went along. And so I wouldn't say that Perth is drought-proofed, but by diversity, by doing a number of different things, educating the people, the, camp, the people in Perth, by also uh, investing in new sources of water, including desalination, and using green energy for that as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by uh, borrowing some water from the irrigators, uh, and pr but in the process, improving the irrigators' uh, efficiency uh, in, in their growth and their productivity, and also providing extra water for in-stream flows at the same time. Also recharging, using uh, recharge of the local groundwater systems and getting industry to reuse the water which had been used once in the domestic scene. All those things brought together into total sustainability through diversity. That leadership has set an example of how things can happen around the world. Transboundary issues, which is the boundary between states or cities or localities where water, like air, is basically shared, it's fluid, right. and somebody tries to control or do something to what they think is their, their part of it. Is, is that a major global issue? It's a major global issue. Uh, there's a <clears throat> very good book called Water Wars. Water Wars. <laughs> yes, which lists, uh, it's now a few years old, but this is all the disputes, <clears throat> and in fact some of the uh, real armed conflicts which are going on, uh, or have been going on around the world. As the water scarcities increase, uh, we could see potentially uh, even more water wars uh, as people want to dam and uh, collect and control uh, water. The consequences of that are you deprive people downstream of some of these things. In other cases, uh, we have where people uh, have allowed... Um, cross-boundary issues uh, in, within a country even. This happens in the United States, it happens in Australia, where it takes many years to resolve many of these issues. The good news is, this is all bad news. Yeah, I'd well, like to hear some good news, you know. <laughs> the good news is, we actually have the technologies, as Orange County have shown us, to do better. We can start closing that water cycle. We can make good quality water come back very much more quickly. Uh, there is nothing to stop that to do with existing technologies and in some cases we've got new technologies coming along which are going to take that even further. Water doesn't disappear if we use it wisely. What would you recommend for those who are watching this show and might be interested to learn more about this and to get involved in, and to get a deeper understanding of the key issues and uh, the necessity of doing something about it? What, what, what can people do? Where can they get more information? And what kind of action, politically or otherwise, do you recommend that they take? In some cases, it's a matter of uh, uh, acting locally and influencing things globally. Look at their water bill. How much water do you use per person per day in your household? What I put to you is if you are using more than about 100 150 litres a day. 150 litres a day for a person, an individual person? That sounds like a lot. But maybe that includes a bath or a shower? Or... It includes all the bath, all the shower, all your food preparation. Put it in context, the uh, WHO, World Health Organization, says that you should have a minimum of 50 litres uh, per person per day uh, for healthy, for, sanit for health, for water, and for good water supply. Um, the most interesting thing is that if you go to some parts of Europe, they now have consumption per capita down to 80 to 90 litres per day. And they've reduced that figure from around about 300. How? By what techniques? By, uh, for example, 
dual flush toilets, or in fact, uh, uh, which is a major use of water. Um, using something like uh, changing the shower head, so you have a low, uh, a low, uh, a low uh, consumption shower head, reducing your showers to two to four minutes, Make, keeping a real concern about how you by stop using water in your garden and uh, using mulch or, and using trickle irrigation or drip irrigation systems. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things are achievable. What about on a community level or a town level, city level, for example? Well, town or city level, uh, how efficient is your water distribution system? Uh, if you've got uh, anything uh, more than 10% water loss in your system, you actually need to to do something about it. How can people globally? What can people do to know what's going on and to take action about? It? I believe it's it's very much a political uh, question and is an administrative question. Uh, the water professionals are there to provide you with that information, and everybody that I know is there and will tell you we're proud to tell you how well we do things. Information, clear information, knowledge, benchmarking, understanding how well you do things. And the US, by the way, in quite a number of areas, is leading the world in some of this benchmarking. Oh, really? Yes. And again, perhaps not being communicated adequately to some of the public. In other cases, uh, we can pick out spots which are maybe not, not so good any, anywhere around the world. But we can take a developing country like Cambodia, the capital of Cambodia, who completely changed their water supply through leadership. They reduced their non-revenue water, water which was being lost through poor pipes or theft or something else like this. So they started collecting their water, uh, all the money for their water. That enabled them to reinvest in a better water supply. Uh -huh. It's now reached a stage where the water supply company now makes a surplus which is reinvesting in sanitation and new water supply and the uh, person who's the president of that uh, company is now revered right through Asia in terms of his leadership to, to actually make this happen. These sorts of examples, uh, whether it's Jim Gill, uh, whether it's Cambodia, whether it's in the United States or Europe, shows that quite often, quite often what we need is that leadership people setting an example, saying how things are going, and other people looking up to them and saying, I can do that. Uh, if people want to get in touch with your organization, the International Water Association, uh, how can they do so, or get information from your organization? They can go to our website, <coughs> www.iwahq.org, and we have a big congress coming up in, in Vienna. Well, I wish you success with it. Thanks very much, Steve. And, and thank you for being with us, too, by the way. Oh, it's a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, and thank you for being with us. I'll just, again, uh, synopsize by saying my very special guest is Dr. David Garman, president of the International Water Association. I'm Steve Steinberg. See you next week on another Dazzle Unlimited. Good night. See you. Thank you.